Okay, we're starting the introduction of the Rambam to Masech the Avos, the, what's so, sometimes called the Ethics of the Fathers. Yesterday I spoke about some general ideas, and uh, I told you I didn't have the right Sefer yesterday, but now I have the right Sefer. And it's called the Eight Chapters because the Eight Chapters long, and he has a short introduction to the Eight Chapters where he talks about the general nature of this tractate of the Mishnah um, and introduces a couple of important ideas of his own, which uh, I, I will uh, translate for you and, and explain to you because they're very fundamental. <coughs> he says that in the beginning of the translation of the commentary of the Mishnah, of which this is a part, explain the general place of all the tractates and why they're situated where they are and what their general purposes are. And I promised you several times in what I wrote previously that when we get to this uh, tractate of Ovos, I will speak about uh, various very important useful ideas and I will um, tolerate a lengthy discussion of these ideas to a certain extent. But even though, if you look at the Mishnahs, in, the Mishnahis in this particular tractate, they're short and they seem to be simple and they seem to be uh, straightforward. Uh, first of all, implementing what's included in it is not easy for many people. You can read it and you can, you can understand what it wants of you, but it, how to actually accomplish it is not easy. And also, there are certain subjects in it which won't be understood without some commentary. It won't be understood appropriately. In addition to the fact that this tractate brings to great perfection and true osher. Now, osher with an aleph, there is considerable discussion how to translate osher with an aleph. We say ashrei. Um, often the translation is happy. If I'm not mistaken, Rav Hirsch says that's not quite right, it's not quite exact. Osher with an aleph is like being successful. It's a, a state of accomplishment and well-being. And the uh, nuances of it vary from, from uh, author to author. And of course, again, this is written in Arabic. The Rabbim is saying that this, this particular tractate, what it tells you to do, brings to great perfection and great osher. Now, perfection in Hebrews is, is the word in Hebrew is shlemus. And Mm, I don't think there's a word in Hebrew that carries precisely the connotation that we have for perfection in English. Perfection in English means no, could not be any better than it is. You can have a, different things. You have a perfect picture and a perfect pencil and a, and a perfect investment. But perfect means it couldn't be better than it is. Shalem means complete. means not missing anything. Hebrew has no chesronos, nothing, nothing missing. Well, that's a kind of highest state, not to be missing any ingredients or missing any features. It's not as general as the idea of, of, of perfection. But it doubles for it because when, when you want to talk about something which lacks nothing, as we would say, then you, you use the word shlemus. So this tractate, you know, there are a lot of tractates in the, in the, in the Mishnah and there are a lot of Gemara. And this tractate is singled out as having this, this very special feature. And he quotes. And therefore, he says, it's appropriate to analyze it in detail. If that is its great uh, ability to, to grant you perfection and, and osher, it's definitely worth um, it's definitely worth uh, expanding on and, and analyzing. And 
Shlemus here for a human being includes the idea of realizing all of his potential. There's something tragic when, about a human being who had potential to do something and it never got realized. If it was potential to do something good or even great and it didn't get realized, that, that certainly would be a lack of um, wholeness in him. So th that's one of the things that this, this tractate did, does. And <clears throat> he quotes now what the Gemara says. Haiman the boy of heavy chassid lekayim mili de avos. A person who wants to be a chassid, yes, that's the word in the Gemara, wants to be a chassid, he should fulfill the ideas, words, dictate, uh, dictates of the tractate of avos. And now the Ramam comments, hmm, you want to be a chassid. What level is that? How does it compare to other levels? Is this, point, is this aiming at the top? Or maybe it's only halfway up the ladder and there are higher levels? Rabbi says, There's no level of spiritual accomplishment above Hasidus. It's the top level of spiritual accomplishment. So that wasn't invented by 17th century mystics in Eastern Europe. The idea of using the word chassid as the title for the highest spiritual achievement, says the Rambam, is what the Gemara is talking about in Bavakama. And this Masechta brings you to it. So that makes this, this tractate very, very important. And then the only thing that's above it is prophecy. And if I say it's the highest spiritual achievement, why isn't prophecy the highest spiritual achievement? And the answer is because prophecy is a gift. You don't make yourself into a prophet. You can prepare yourself for prophecy, and then Kodesh Baruch Hu decides whether to give it to you or not for his own purposes. So prophecy isn't an achievement. Prophecy is a gift. All you do is prepare yourself for prophecy, and that's what this, this tractate does. Boy, oh boy. The, the significance of this tractate now is becoming you know, gigantic. And he quotes uh, a, uh, a, another uh, Talmudic source, Hasidus mevia lidei Ruach HaKodesh. Hasidus brings a person to Holy Spirit, and often Ruach HaKodesh and Nevuah, Holy Spirit and prophecy, aren't distinguished carefully in these, in these kinds of discussions. Although there's a distinction to be made, he's not working that distinction here. So he says, it's clear from the way the sages of the Talmud have described it, that a person who organizes his life according to the Musar, the, the practical instruction of how to live that's found in this, in this tractate, will bring him to Nevoah, of course, again, if a Kodesh Baruch Hu chooses to give it to him. And we're going to explain these things in more detail in the eight chapters that we're going to, going to uh, present for you. That this tractate uh, discusses and describes a great portion of the appropriate character traits that a person should have. And one of the prerequisites for, pro for, for prophecy is having good character. And although, as he will tell us, uh, you don't have to have perfect character, because the Rambam is very critical of the greatest of our history, historical figures that they had failures of character, and we'll see that in Mir Hashem, and we'll see how we discuss, because not everybody agrees that they were failures of character, but it is one of the most important prerequisites, uh, and this, this uh, tractate addresses what they should be and how to achieve them. And he said, I, I, it seemed appropriate for me to, before I go into the actual tractate, to pre uh, preface it with um, chapters that will be useful, uh, from which a person will get various introductory ideas, which will then be the, a key to understanding what we'll explain in the chapter, in the uh, of this tractate. 
Now, um, the Rabbah now explains where he is coming from in writing his commentary. I think, and maybe Mir Hashem, I will do this someday, get to take together all the places where the Rambam speaks in the first person. This is what I think, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing it, this is what I accomplished, what I didn't accomplish. The year he's making an autobiographical remark. I want you to know that the subject which I discuss in these chapters, and also which I will put into commentary afterwards, um, they're not things which I uh, thought of on my own. And they're not commentaries which I invented, which I made new. Rather, they are uh, uh, ideas and subjects gathered from the sages of the Midrash and the Talmud, and others of their writings. The Rambam's denying originality here. That's interesting. Uh, and of course, I don't know if we have access to all of the sources. So the fact that we see something here that we don't find any of the sources doesn't mean that he wasn't making it for another source. I'm inclined to think, I'm thinking now, but this is unbelievable. <laughs> Another contact between the Rambam and the, and, and the Ramchal. But you know, if you read them and think about them, there's, there's, there's dozens and dozens. In the Mesil Sashorim, in the introduction, the Ramchal says, I've gathered together here ideas that are familiar ideas, and if you read through it, you'll probably find that there's nothing new. Nothing new in the Mesil Sashorim. Nothing new. But he says, I, I put them together because these things need rep repetition. And if you read my Savior over and over again, and you repeat them over and over again, you get the benefit of instilling them in your heart, you know, and, 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 and integrating them. Boy, when you read the Sefer and you see the things that he put in, and you're puzzled out trying to understand what they mean and so forth and so on. So I think there's a little bit of that in the Rambam here also. But at any rate, he's saying, I want you to know I had lots of sources. Now, he said, from the statements of the, of, the, of the Talmud and the Midrash and other works of those authors, and also from the words of the philosophers. The ancient philosophers and the later philosophers. And from the compositions of many people. I read widely, and I take the things that I want to use for this, for this uh, uh, essay. And he says, makes, says f four words which are very widely quoted, but they don't quote the context or the other places where he wrote it. Kabbalah MSVP Omro. Receive the truth of the one who says it. Don't be prejudiced. Don't be prejudiced. For or against. Receive the truth from the one who says it. The first half is, is, is obvious. Don't be prejudiced against something because somebody said it. If it's true, accept it. But implied, as you will see, is also don't accept something just because he said it. Make sure that it's MS. Kabbalah MS. Mi pi omro. And he says, there will be times when I will bring a whole statement which is in the language of, the, of some other author. And there's no, there's no uh, uh, evil in that or no fault in that. And I will not quote him by name. Now, that raises the alarm bells. Don't we have a mitzvah to quote uh, the authors by name? Doesn't it say that when Esther told Achashverosh that Mordechai told the two people are plotting against the king, and it was and it was investigated and found out, and they, they caught them and punished them. And Mordechai's name was written down in the book of memos, not the history book, Sefer Zichronos, not Sefer Divrei Hayyamim. And the memos were memos for future action, and that's why uh, was so worried four years later when he couldn't sleep and he found his name there. And he said, "We didn't do anything, because this wasn't just a history book. This was the memos book." 
There's no notation that he did anything. So if Esther had not mentioned this in Mordechai's name and had not been written down in the memos book in Mordechai's name, then when Haman came to destroy him, there wouldn't have been a way, well, this way to, uh, I should say carefully, this way to save him wouldn't have been available. So from that, the Gemara says, someone who says something in someone's name uh, brings uh, redemption to the world. And the Ram is saying here, uh, in my commentary here, you'll find word for word quotations from other places, and I'm not going to tell you his name. I won't mention his name. So he says, because I've already explained to you here in the introduction that I will be doing this. So these, this wonderful Ma'or edition has comments down to a sefer called Pedus Yaakov, which quotes Rechaim Kanievsky. Down to our own day. Rechaim Kanievsky says, since he's telling you there will be quotations, and he's telling you that he won't use their names, and the quotations are from literature that's available, if someone wants to know, he can go look it up or ask somebody who knows where it is. No, not, it's not as if I'm going to omit the name and it won't be available to the, the interested reader to find out where it came from. And that's enough. You don't have to say it out yourself. It's, the implication seems to be if you don't say that it came from somebody else, it's as if you're taking credit for it. No, you should make sure. But if I'm telling you that, there, that it's quotations, I know there are quotations in here from the Kuzuri, and he doesn't mention his name. Okay? Now, the Rama goes on to say, um, and even though, so, even though uh, I don't say so and so said and so and so said, that's extra length that has no value to it. And also, he says, it could be that if I mention the name of the author and the reader has a grudge against that author, then the reader will think, well, let's see, I might have mentioned it. I'm reading it. Gee, sounds okay. Um, sounds reasonable. But if he wrote it, there's got to be something wrong with it. And he'll, and he'll let his prejudice against the author prejudice him against what I'm quoting from the author. And that's not right. Because as he said, Kabel esa MSBP Amro. If someone says something that's correct, so then you should accept what he says, even if he says other things that are incorrect. So I'm afraid of creating that kind of prejudice as one of my reasons for not quoting my sources. Now, these words have to be read in conjunction with what he writes in the Mishnah Torah, where he's talking about Kiddush HaChodesh. Kiddush HaChodesh is sanctified the new moon, which requires a certain amount of complicated astronomy. And he says there, our prophets had the greatest grasp of astronomy because they had it from prophecy. Which Bokhu gave it to them. But we lost it. The, the vicissitudes of exile meant that we lost that, that expertise. And when the sages of the Talmud and later sages had to try to reanalyze the astronomical data, they used Greek sources. <clears throat> because that's all, they, that's all they had. And now he explains what is the attitude towards using something like Greek sources. And he says, uh, this is written in Hebrew, so I'm going to read the Hebrew and I'll translate it. shekol elu hadvarim hein dofi since all the principles that we used here for these calculations have clear proofs Proofs that have no weaknesses. And it's impossible for a person to question them. Then it doesn't make any difference who wrote them, whether the author was a prophet or whether the author was a non Jew, makes absolutely no difference. Because even if a prophet wrote it, I'm not accepting it on the basis of the fact that he's a prophet and God told him. I'm accepting it on the, face, on the basis of the fact that I analyzed it. And I know the proofs. And I know that it's right. 
That's when he says, Kabbalah is MSLP on row. When the person says something and you analyze it independently with your own with your own understanding, and you see that it's right, the fact that you heard it first from Plony doesn't make any difference. He supplied you with the thought to think about, but then you, when you assert it, you assert it on your own authority. You don't assert it because he said so. She called Dovish. It is Galatamo. Anything whose Reasoning has, is revealed. V'noda amitaso v'rayos she'ev and dolfi. Anything and, is, and its truth is known through proofs that are solid. Ein somchim al zehaish sh'amro. You're not relying on the man who said it. O shalindo, the one who taught it. El araya shenizgalo o atam shenoda. You're relying on the proof that was provided or the reason that, uh, that is known. So when the Rambam quotes, he quotes on the basis of his own understanding. Um, the Rambam agrees considerably with Aristotle and disagrees considerably with Aristotle. And some people have misunderstood the agreements that he has as if he thinks it's Aristotle's authority, a great thinker, and he should accept his words, and so on and so on. Not so. Kabbalah as a MSBP Omro doesn't mean because he was a great man, I accept it, even though I don't see that it's true, because he said so and I take it to be true. It does not mean that. It means he thought of it and you didn't. He wrote it in the book and you didn't think it up yourself. Okay, take it as a matter for consideration. And then if you can see that it's correct beginning of the second part of the, of the Guide of the Perplexed, the Roman starts an investigation, and he says, I'm going to base this investigation on 26 principles from Aristotle. 26, eh? Okay. And he says, the first 25 are true, and the 26th is false. Why am I using it? Because I want to establish something, even on the basis of a false premise, to cover a certain logical loophole. But he said it's false. The 26th one is the eternity of the world. He was against that with, with, with two hands. So, but Aristotle said so. So what? The first 25, I went through the reasoning, the Rambam says, and I, I know they're true. And the 26th, I know is not true. On the basis of what he says in 225, it's a long, complicated story. So something is true here. When the Rambam brings these things, He's not relying on the authority of the speaker, and therefore he, he says the information is available, and if I mention the speaker, so he's now, I think, we have to build this into the understanding here. If I mention the speaker, number one, if somebody's prejudiced against him, I say it because I say it's true. But if I tell you that Polony said it, he'll think, oh no, there's got to be something wrong with it. My mind just didn't see it. He didn't realize there was something wrong with it. But I know that this guy's not reliable, not reliable, and therefore there must be something wrong with it. No, that's not correct, because Rambam is not relying on him at all. He's simply saying it on his own authority. Um, and if he brought the names of the authors themselves, then some might think he is relying on the authority. And he's not doing that. It was an extremely important statement about Rambam's methodology that, uh, that we have here. Yeah. Agreeing entirely with the authority. Well, which tools you use is also a decision. Yeah. And he wouldn't accept the tools of the authority uh, without subjecting them to his own analysis and, and trust also. Yeah. Indeed, you know, with the with the eternity of the world, it's quite interesting that Aristotle taught the eternity of the world. And many people used it against Maimonides, because, of course, we don't believe the world is eternal. The world was created. Right? And he makes a point of saying that if you read Aristotle carefully, you'll see that he didn't think that he had demonstrated it either. So he himself wasn't putting it forward as something which he's established to be true. He's putting it forth because he thinks it's a hypothesis that's supported, and maybe it's better supported than other competing hypotheses, but not because he's established it to be true. 
And this he disagreed with other commentators of Aristotle, although Alexander agreed with him. Alexander's the great interpreter of Aristotle. Uh, he agreed with Alexander, Alexander used him as a, as a support. So um, he, he means that to, to soften the opposition of people who are leaning on Aristotle. But he would have had no trouble in, in, um, in disagreeing with Aristotle, if, even if Aristotle thought he approved it. Wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have made any difference to him. Okay, so that's, that's his... Um, And therefore, he says, I, I decided here not to, uh, to cite the names of the people that I'm taking from and just to analyze the things in terms of themselves. Okay. And now he says he's going to start the eight chapters. So now, this is what I started to read yesterday, but now I have the, the better translation. The nefesh of a person, we said yesterday for him, nefesh means soul, is one, and it has many different Functions, behavior, capabilities, and some people call them many, fun many souls, but it's not strictly correct. One famous author said that there are three. Um, now, um, Tivis, Chiyunis, Venafshis. Those words are hard to make precise, and he's not, he's not going to use them himself. Uh, and sometimes they're called powers, and sometimes they're called parts instead of called separate souls. The terminology is not consistent, and it's not, uh, not revealing. Because and then they talk about the parts of the, of the soul. And many philosophers use this type of terminology. And when they say parts, it doesn't mean that the soul has parts like the body has parts. If, for example, you say, well, there's a part of the soul that, that's, that's in, like I said yesterday, is in charge of growth, and a part of the soul is in charge of sensation, and part of the soul is a, that's, that's uh, in, in charge of motion, that's not like having arms and legs and eyes and ears and, uh, and fingers and toes, which are physically different parts, which have different character and different capabilities. It's not that the soul has parts that you can divide up in, in that fashion, that it's a conglomerate of different things, each with its own character, sort of uh, conglomerated together. Really what they're talking about is different functions, different activities. And because of different activities, it's like the different activities of the, uh, of the um, parts of the, of the body. In the, in, the, in the book, he gives a very interesting analogy to this, which is an analogy that, that, that applies uh, very often. Uh, he wants to talk about the soul having many functions. He says, take heat, for example. When you apply, let's say, strong heat to something, well, there are certain solid things that melt and become liquid. And there's certain liquid things, like a raw egg, which become solid. And some things burn, burn up. And hard things sometimes become soft. And soft things, you know, like for example, you take meat, which you can't chew with your te teeth, and you cook it, and then you can't chew it with your teeth. But it's all heat. It's only one thing, it just provides heat. But what it does to the things around it are various, we would say, because the heat's being applied to different things. Okay. But it's one thing providing a single power which has different effects. So similarly, the soul has different effects, not because it's composed of different things like hands and feet and fingers and toes, but because it has a certain power, and that power relates to different things in different ways. And in particular, when that power is associated with the body, and the body has different features. So if you think, for example, of the soul, this is only a first pass and it's superficial, 
You think of the soul as a kind of something that enlivens things. Like so put it, it, it's like elect, ele, an electrical source, electrical socket in the house. You could plug in a radio. You could plug in the vacuum cleaner. You can, you can, you can plug in the, you know, the electric uh, soccer, soccer game. It's all electricity, right? So it's all electricity. The different items you plug in get you different uh, uh, activities, uh, which are which are enlivened by the by the electricity. So here, the soul is related to the body. Gives rise to different types of activities, and even within itself, it has the power of, of affecting different types of activities, but it's only one thing. It's only one thing only, with only one essence. Now, he says, you know, I mean, he's writing to, to a reader, you know that when you're talking about your character traits, which is going to be part of the soul, talking about character traits, and you're talking about improving them, Proving your character, this is medicine or med- medicinal, um, medicinal um, application to the soul and its ca- and its powers. So the analogy between the doctor for the soul and the doctor for the body. If your character traits need perfecting, if there are failures in your character traits, that, in a certain sense, is similar to a failure in the functioning of the body. And there are analogies between the principles for both. Now, the person, by the way, of course, the the Rambab was 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 a doctor, among other things. Just like the doctor who's going to treat physical illness has to know what bodies are, and he has to know how it works. Has to know the general ways in which the body operates and the way it reacts to various uh, things that apply to it. He has to know the different parts of the body. And he says, I'm speaking about the human body because that's what doctors generally treat. So, uh, and he has to know what are the maladies that affect the body. The person has a stomach ache. There are a lot of different causes for stomach ache. Everything from uh, spoiled food to appendicitis. So um, he's got to know what the, what the different maladies are. And he has to know what the remedies are, which can restore health. So too, the one who is going to be a doctor for the soul and wants to straighten, improve, perfect the character traits of a person has to know how what the nefesh is and what its parts are, meaning its different functions, and what kinds of um, disabilities, imbalances, um, disruptions the soul is subject to, and what can what can cure it. So, he said before that the whole point of this, I mean, a great deal of the of the, of the tractate is to address your character traits. So now he's using what he's introduced so far to start to give background for that process. Who are these people that you think are the doctors of the soul? They are sages. They are the ones who know the soul and know what it needs. So therefore, he said, I'm going to tell you something about the way the soul is structured. And I say that there are five parts. Um, Hazan, which means that's capable of of nutrition. Magish, which is sensation. Hamadama. So often the Madama is translated as imagination. But I want to point out, or Maizu pointed this out to me, that the word Madama in Hebrew has no connection whatsoever with images. Madama comes from the word dome, which means similar. So at least part of what's going on is this. This is an ability of the soul to track similarities. 
And similarities are how you form categories. It's how you form concepts and groups. Because you form a group by citing a certain similarity of the things in the group, typically. I know, I taught set theory, so I know you can do it artificially. You can have a set whose only three members are Mount Everest and Beethoven and the Taj Mahal. I know you can do that. But that's not typical. It's not useful either. It's just useful for set theory textbooks. It's not <laughs> useful for anything, anything real. <coughs> so this would mean, this would be the ability to conceptualize. It's used sometimes to include pictures, and that's a reason that we'll try to explain when we get there. But it's not fundamentally the, the idea. Because when you talk about the imagination, the first letters of imagination are image, aren't they? It means the thing that plays with pictures in your mind. And Madonna is not necessarily related to pictures in your mind. Yeah. Would this be something like pattern recognition? It would be included in pattern recognition, but it's much, much more general than that. Yeah, so, so it would be something like the ability to recognize patterns and then abstract and apply those patterns in different categories or domains. Yeah, but that's much later. That's much further down the line. Uh, you know, yeah. there was a great debate, still to a certain extent, is in philosophy between the rationalists and the empiricists. And one feature of the debate was, can you know things other than from learning of them by, from experience? Ah, gigantic debate about that. But one thing that was pointed out, I know that I lived through the shift from behaviorism to, to later philosophy in the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, it was pointed out this. Let's say you're an empiricist and you think that you learn from experience. But one thing that you need to be able to do before you can learn anything from experience is to identify the same thing again. Well, that means you've got to have the ability to associate things as the same and things as different. Otherwise, how do you know it's the same one again? How do you associate, how do you associate round with soft? If you, if, when you see round, you see round again, you think it's brand new. You don't recognize that it's the same as that one. Or we see round, you see, see, see square, and then you think it's the same thing, and, 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 and then you and see one is soft and one isn't soft. You've got to have an innate quality space. A quality space means these features are the way you group things together and identify that the, something's happened again so you can form generalizations from it. So you've got to start with something you didn't learn from experience. If you didn't start with the quality space, you couldn't learn anything from experience. So the idea of there being similarities between things, now you don't have to stay with this. You can, you can learn many other new similarities. For example, owned by George. <laughs> You're not born with that. And that's a similarity that some things have and other things don't have. Um, and you can turn your back on some similarities. Afterwards, they say they're very superficial. They were only uh, functional in my very limited environment, but now they're not useful anymore. That could be. But without starting with one with, that you didn't learn from experience, you couldn't learn anything from experience. Since Kocham and Dame, the ability to make comparisons is, uh, and, and note similarities is a fundamental feature of the, of the mind. So that's the third one. Misorer is that which leads to action. Misorer, which really means to be, to be aroused, uh, wake up, and is what leads to action, which includes motivation, it includes will, and um, other features. That's the, the abilities that underlie action. And hegioni, which is what we would call intellect or logic. Those are the five levels of the soul that he, that he recognizes. And now he's going to describe the functioning of each one. And although I will go through it, the one that's of most importance to us is what he calls the hegioni, which is the, um, which is the logical one. And there are some surprises in store when we, when we get to that one. And now he says, I'm talking here about the nephish of a person. And 
And now he says what I, what I mentioned yesterday. He says, because the nourishing of a human being is not like the nourishing of the donkey or the horse. Now, this goes against our prejudices. You have a physical body and a horse has a physical body. You eat food and it eats food. You get strength and you get energy from the food and it gets strength and it eats the food. Why shouldn't the principles be the same? Says the Rabbim, wrong. That's not how it works. Because the person gets his ability to, to be nourished from the nourishing part of the human soul. And the donkey is nourished from the nourishing part of the donkey soul. Of course, soul here means just the life force in the body. That's all. And the um, palm tree is, gets its nourishing force from the nourishing part of the nefesh that belongs to it. Each thing that it's interesting here, the Raman classifies it as if it were alive, even though in Hebrew the, the word chai doesn't apply. And we don't say that all these different things get nourishment, um, we, that we say that they're nourished, and we use the word nourished to, to describe all of them, that's just an accident. It's, it's, not, it's not true that it's the same process. So let's see if I can give you an example. Um, let's use the word shine for something which produces light. And I say, well, fire shine. Fireflies have lights in their tails which shine. Phosphorescent rocks shine. The sun shines. Are they all doing the same thing? Not really. I mean, the processes by which the light comes out are very different in each case. The sun is using nuclear fusion, and fires are using oxidation, and phosphorescence is using radioactivity, and uh, fireflies is using something else. I mean, so you say shine, 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 but you're not really talking about the same thing. You're talking about light coming out, but the process by which it happens is very, very different. So if you say that um, a human being is nourished and a, a, a donkey is nourished and a palm tree is nourished, it's nourished, 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 but it isn't the same process at all. Because each thing has a different principle that gives it its life. And in each case, the principle that gives it life has in it a nourishing feature, but the nourishing feature is the nourishing feature of that principle of life. And the principle of life of a donkey is not the same as the principle of life as a human being. So this is what I told you yesterday, that there are two views about these things. And it's reflected in the terminology that the Rambam mentioned. There are those who want to say that what we call the human soul is only the intellect, perhaps, and the active part which drives to action, or maybe just the intellect, and the rest of the features of the human being are really the same features as you have in animals and in, and in plants. The Rambam rejects that. And he says, when you look at the growing human, being, human body and the growing donkey body and the growing palm tree, and to you it looks similar, he gives an analogy. He says, let's say you are standing and you're looking at, at two figures a hundred yards away, the other end of the football field. You say, well, look at that, you know. They both have arms and legs. They both have a head. Both have feet. I guess they're two people. When you get closer, you see that one is human and one is a monkey. Well, then they aren't both human, are they? They just looked superficially from a distance to be similar enough that you didn't realize that they're essentially different. Same thing's true with these features. If you would look deeply into the growth of the horse body, of the uh, donkey body, you would see that it's coming from a different principle, from the pr principle of human, uh, human growth and palm growth. 
Now, I'm not talking now about the way modern science will look at it. I'm talking about the, what the Rambam says about it and the conclusions that he's going to draw from it. That's, that's the way his picture works. The only reason we use the word nizon for all of them is because it's, a, it's just a, an, an analogous appearance. And it's, but it really, if you talk about what the process is, they're, they're different processes altogether. It's so not talking about the thing itself. Yeah? So you're saying that features come across these categories, but the principle that produces the feature is different with the different categories. So from a distance, you have this low, low resolution picture of the absorption of all these categories, but how each category embodies its growth follows a different principle. I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. I think for, for, a, for a plant, uh, you could see it. If, if I were giving an analogy, I would give an analogy of the growth of a crystal in a saturated solution. Right? So it grows, and, and it grows, it grows a certain way, and then it slows down as it uses up the saturated, it, 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 uh, it, it, it slows down its growth. That's not at all the way grass grows, it's not all the way uh, animals grow, they grow in, 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 in very different ways. But when you come to, let's say, the human body and the animal body, there, they're not going to, uh, they're not going to, uh, to agree to it. Now, maybe I'll make a remark here that, that may, may make this a little bit closer. What about a person who doesn't eat because he's depressed? Well, you say he's not eating. All right, but can't your emotional state affect your digestion? So then your emotional state affects your digestion. I wonder if that's true for horses. It doesn't sound like, like it's going to obviously be true for horses. But then that means there's something about the unique human soul that plays a role in digestion. So digestion, is a, to, to a certain extent, is a feature of a human soul in a way that it isn't for others. Right? And, uh, you know, warm-blooded animals are going to be different from cold-blooded animals. And they're going to be, of course, the difference between a, door, a horse and a, and a donkey not the same as if you're a horse and a, and a frog or a horse and a, and, and a, and a butterfly. But um, whatever differences there are, they're going to reflect that the nutrition of each is a function of its particular soul that gives it its life force, its life principle. Um, and that's going to be different for human beings. So it's, it's not, so, not so difficult to make some kind of connection with what the Ramah was saying to the way we were thinking of things today. Okay, very good.